We have a little after six. We're going to go ahead and get started. Okay. Need a gavel tonight. Everybody's having a good time fellowshipping. That's a good thing. Um, welcome to the Jackson County Board of Education uh, work session for the month of October. Um, we got a lot on the agenda tonight, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Dr. Howard, I'll turn it over to you. Very Go good. Ahead. I am going to be concise because we do have some very important um, information to hear from our schools, so we want to prioritize that. Had a great principals meeting today. want to continue to thank our principals for the work they do. It's been an interesting start, and I think this meeting is a great beginning to a regular rest of the year. We, we are not planning for any more disruption, so I apologize <laughs> for the disruption with the board meeting uh, that happened as a result of the hurricane, but we, we are ready for a great remainder of the year. Just a reminder, uh, thank you, Amanda. We are all registered for GSBA. She has our registration taken care of as well as accommodations. So before you leave today, if you can just confirm exact dates and that you will need those, that's all taken care of. That is a Friday and Saturday date. We're not going Thursday? We sure. are. November 30th is the training day. Okay. So GSBA, the actual right. conference, is the first and second. But we'll be going Thursday right. and Friday and Saturday. Right. Correct, because we, we do that as one of our whole board yep. trainings. So you're exactly right. Um, just a reminder that our, our official October board meeting will be Monday evening at East Jackson Elementary School where we'll highlight that school and they've got some great things going on. We look forward to hearing that and we will catch up with some of our recognitions from the September meeting but the actual um, recognition and um, special sharing of West Middle we're going to do at Gum Springs and Miss Hanley and Mr. Cobb are kind of working in tandem because that's the following month so we didn't get to visit their school in, as, in light of the uh, postponed meeting. The next one is just for your consideration. I wanted to offer this to you. In years past, as you know, we've done a BOE school tour. I know that it's a very busy time of year, but if that's something that you all would like to do, please let me know and we'll pick out a time. I think for our schools, we probably want to do that sometime uh, January, February time frame, if that would work. Um, this time between now and, and the holidays get kind of hectic, but any time is, is available. But if you all can talk and let me know if we want to look at doing a tour. We can plan that for January or February, or at your preference, we can do it in November if that works. Um, we obviously have missed three school days, and so we spoke with principals today, and we've um, talked among ourselves and would like to recommend this weather makeup plan, and you have a handout there. You know that we missed three days as a result of Irma. Two of those days were uh, governor's office state of emergency days, and then the third day, um, was a district decision based on the numbers of people we still had without power and everybody recalls that um, and hope we don't have to experience that again and certainly the families don't. But we'd like to recommend that we just watch this and that if we have any additional days that we certainly plan for makeup and we publicize that families need to reserve these days. But should we not have any more weather days, our principals feel like we can catch our students up and take those as forgiveness days since we have a full calendar and two of those were um, for, were state of emergencies anyway. So with your blessing, we'd like to be able to give families some information about what the plan is, um, and this would be the plan, with the understanding that if something should happen in January or February or heavens, March, I mean, you just yeah. never know. It can happen in March. It yeah. sure does, yeah. the ice, especially for ice. So um, that that being the recommendation for that. Any concerns about that? I know that there's a couple districts I've seen on the news that are extending the day like 20 or 30 minutes a day to kind of make, make up, up for the that. time. Mm -hmm. so. And we can certainly consider that, especially if we should get into additional days. The, the challenge, and it, it's not um, a significant challenge, but you've got so many extracurricular sure, activities sure. that when you extend the day, it has a, a kind of a domino effect. But we can start, we can certainly manage it. I mean, large districts, large districts can do it like we can do it. <laughs> um, we'll monitor, hope for, uh, not too much, try to, you know, inclement weather this, this winter and uh, this will be the case. But think about that and let me know if you have any questions about that. And just a reminder that this is a farm to school month and our highlight school this particular year is North Jackson Elementary School. So on October 27th, that's farm to school week. Dr. Morris is in the training in Macon, so she's not here tonight, but I told her I would include this handout and Feed My School Week is, is coming up. So again, a very special thank you to our, our principals and district leaders for keeping the focus on instructional um, improvement and doing the best we can by our kids for remarkable experiences in the light of lots of <coughs> disruption at the beginning of the year. So we're on track for a great rest of the year. And with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Nicholson and 
tell us a little bit about who we get to hear from tonight. Absolutely. So we're going to continue with our school performance reports, and I believe this is the final round, final round of reports. So this evening we have Gum Springs, Maysville, North Jackson, and West Jackson Elementary. And I believe, just so that you know who's next, we'll go in the order as they're printed on the uh, agenda. So if Gum Springs would come forth and share your school performance report, we'd appreciate it. And as they're coming forward, they, they prepared some, some documents to, for you to have as a reference. Um, so they certainly will not share all of this. They'll just be sharing the highlights because we have asked them to be considered at time. So we'll do that. Absolutely. And if I go over five minutes, y'all can tell me. Set the timer right There you go. All right. Okay. Well, thank you for giving us an opportunity to share our performance and where we want to improve. Um, in looking at what our greatest area of achievement, we looked at fourth grade. Fourth grade English, language, arts, and math levels three and four were 54% of our fourth grade students scored level three and four on language arts and 52% of our fourth graders. Uh, scored level three or four on the math, so we were very proud of that performance. And and what do we attribute that to? Our fourth grade teachers are active participants in collaborative planning. They work together as a team to come up with good strategies for the classroom. They participate in professional learning both at the school level and the district level. They take advantage of our instructional coach and all the support that she's able to provide. And they're also consistent with instruction and have very high expectations for their students. Um, these teachers use assessment data to help students set goals. They conference with students and talk about their progress so that students know where they need to be working. Um, and they use that data to provide practice that is right on target for what the kids need. And they give immediate feedback. Um, our greatest area of need, it screamed loudly across all three grade levels, and that was text-dependent narrative writing. The students being able to do constructive responses based on a text from the milestones. That, um, that was a need in third grade, 64% of our third graders. Um, that was an area of need for them. 41% of our fourth graders and 38% of our fifth graders scored a zero or a one. That's not acceptable. So we're taking steps to make sure that that improves. Um, we have worked on school-based English language arts vertical team to develop school-wide reading and writing expectations which have been shared with our teachers. That vertical team presented that to our teachers. In addition, we have in, uh, contracted with Dr. Kevin Rosinski from the University of Georgia Center for Assessment to provide professional development for grade specific. We'll have a three through five grade band workshop with him and then a K2 so that we look at narrative writing, text dependent writing, and text dependent questioning and reading to make sure that they understand what they're reading so that they can better perform in that area. So that's really a key focus for us is improving that text-based response. Um, in looking at our growth, our, our greatest area of growth was a surprise. Our third grade math was our greatest area of growth. In 2015, uh, well, this year we had 50% of our students score at level three and four. And that was up from 33% in 2015 and 40% in 2016. So that was a substantial growth. Um, what do we attribute that to? We had two brand new excited teachers who were teaching math. They went gung-ho. They've gone to classes. They've participated in things with Dr. Warwick. Um, Ms. Wilson, our instructional coach, has worked with those teachers. And they are active members of the vertical math team. So our vertical math team has analyzed what we need to do across grade levels, where are our weaknesses, where are our strengths, and they have given a list of expectations to the teachers. What, these are the things that we expect to be covered in math at Gum Springs. So they have all participated in that and they participated in uh, district courses as well as some outside of the school. Our lowest school growth area, um, and those are some subgroups. And we looked at, there's three in particular that we're going to work on. The ELL students, so the ESOL students, are our, our special ed students, the students with disabilities, and our economically disadvantaged students. We did not show adequate growth, in our opinion, in those areas. Uh, when we looked at the language arts, um, scoring at a level one, our ELL students, 8% scored that. 
Our economically disadvantaged, 52% of those kids scored at a level one, and 43% of our students with disabilities scored at a level one. So we are doing much data collaboration, some of the things that we have changed to accommodate that. Um, we have day, uh, Tuesday is our collab day, we call it, call it Tuesday Collab. We meet with the teachers. We were doing professional development, we were showing them new software packages, we were looking at data. So we've stopped all of that and said we're just looking at data so it's called a data collab so we look at the map data we look at the classroom data we look at student work and we talk about how we can help those students grow and it's also a time where we discuss the kids who are having difficulties how we're going to help them and as a grade level team they own that whole group and so during that time we're going to hone in on the things that are a problem we're going to figure out which are instructional which kids need extra help and we'll work from there to improve those things. We've also done some scheduling changes. Our third grade had three-man teams and it really segmented our day a bit and we've gone back to two-man teams there. Um, we changed our ELT time, our extended learning time. We had one segment at the beginning because we didn't have enough special ed segments, so we had to do a, just one segment of ELT. Mm -hmm. Now it's broken up so every grade level has a separate time where we can push in and help those students. Um, our school improvement goals, would you like me to read those or just? Or share, whatever, just okay. Like, All right, so we've set goals in math and language arts, and basically we're, we're wanting to see a 3% growth. That is the basic. There's a whole, there's a long goal that I won't share. We also want to increase our parent communication through multiple platforms, including print, digital, remind, websites, callers, and all kinds of things to communicate with our stakeholders. And we want to increase our attendance. That is our fourth goal. We would like to see our attendance at 96% or above. Are there any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hamm, great job. And while it's not official out there yet, we were able to do some work this morning with principals and look at growth, and there has been very significant growth that comes from us. And I want to be proud of when it's official, we'll celebrate that. Thank you. And next up, we have Maysville, the dynamic duo from Maysville. You get a twofer right now. <laughs> Coming up. Good evening, board, and, and all the members of our community who are tuning in right now. Um, it seems like it was just a, a year ago when we were talking about the strategic waiver and the things that we were going to be doing to change um, flexibly in the school. And um, we're here to give you a report on how some of that's been going. And so, um, our school's greatest areas of achievement well, we have some improvements in reading and in math. Um, looking at the Georgia Milestones Assessment as well as the MAP Assessment and the one-on-one -on -one performance assessment that we use as a district called the BLT Rigby Assessment. Um, in reading, particularly, our fourth grade was extraordinarily strong in the area of reading on the Georgia Milestones with um, out, our students outperforming the, the state average there and most exciting for us as well is the growth that we have seen um, at, at, at exponential numbers on our Rigby assessment which is the one-on-one -on -one reading assessment that our teachers do um, with students and we had significant gains across all grade levels there. Um, in math we were ex very excited that our third grade students in particular outperform both district and state um, gains in the areas of operations and algebraic thinking as well as um, on the math assessment our kindergarten students had a, a huge significant strength in that same area but at the kindergarten level. Um, the things that we feel have contributed to this success is most definitely one of the things that we take pride in at our school is the supportive relationships that we have with our students, their families, and that the community but also among staff members. Um, also we take a very granular approach at looking at the intensive, very just fine tooth focus on individual students' needs. We have grown really strong in our intervention processes at our school and work daily, monthly, hourly sometimes on the needs of our kids and, and having some keen conversations about that. 
strategic scheduling to make sure we're giving, we're giving just right instruction to our kids. Not only remediation, which we tend to focus on a good bit, but also enrichment and advancing students in areas where they have um, those opportunities as well. We had the pleasure of implementing and receiving some coaching and foundations in grades um, K through three, and we contribute that specifically to a lot of the success that we saw in our gains in our lower grades when, in reading as well. We used the extended learning time throughout the day to give some of our resource pieces for extra dips of support so that we're not taking kids out of their content instruction for um, ESOL services, gifted services, but in addition to that, our intervention delivery. And um, we've been able to secure an 80 to 90 minute instructional block for both ELA and math. And um, of course, professional learning and coaching and supporting the, the work that our teachers are doing as well. Our school's greatest area of need, our third and fifth grade students is Lexile performance and getting them to um, state standards on Lexiles. Um, also, according to our MAP data, vocabulary acquisition for grades one through five and reading informational text is a weakness for our third and fourth graders. In math, according to the milestones, we have um, measurement and data and geometry are a significant area of need. And then according to the map, we have, um, once again, it's the same thing. So what are we going to do? We're going to ensure a consistent, persuasive tier one, and we're focusing on that tier one instruction for not only literacy, but also math. We're going to implement student goal settings for all of our kids in both areas, continue explicitly identifying and focusing on those each child and finding their weaknesses and helping them progress toward their strength to make it become strengths. We're going to collaborate and review student work and our data and plan for instruction. We're also going to continue our teachers to participate. This year we're participating in the Grown Readers um, PLC through Northeast Georgia RESA and continue with Guided Math and Eureka through our district math specialist. Um, when we think about growth, this is an area where we really pride ourselves at Maysville. Achievement levels are one thing in how we're comparing our students' performance to the performance not only of our district, our RESA district, but also across the, the, the state. Growth is another piece and where our kids are coming in when they walk in the door and where they are exiting at the end of that year. And as we look across all of our data pieces, um, particularly in reading and ELA, just as we saw on the, the milestones for achievement levels, our fourth grade students, um, we had tremendous um, levels of typical or high growth. And we spoke about this, as Dr. Howard said earlier, as principals. Just alone, 74% of our fourth grade students showed typical or high growth on that GMAS, which is just, a, you know, 65% is where we'd like to be, but we're just tickled that, it, that we're at 74% there. And 63% of our fifth graders. Um, showed that typical or high growth, so we're excited about that. On the MAP assessment, um, third and fifth grade students exceeded their uh, MAP RIT growth targets in reading um, at, at high levels, and in math, um, our kindergarten students blew it out of the water on their growth. They did exceptionally well um, along with our fifth grade students. Uh -huh. And we're digging through that data a little deeper because what we're finding in the map piece, particularly in fifth grade with growth, isn't quite matching what we're seeing on the Georgia Milestones assessment. So that's um, as we dig through the data and look specifically at students' needs, we're getting down to those domain levels and seeing if those areas that we identified earlier, geometry and measurement and data are really what's tricking us up some. So we're working on that. Um, so what do we attribute the success, success to? Well, it's those same things we just spoke to a few minutes ago and that what we're doing for achievement is what we're doing to stage our students for growth. And so that will be just a repeat of what we've already said. And our school's lowest area of growth is this year we're focusing with um, our second and fourth grade students um, to help them with their MAP RIT targets and reading. And only 30% of math of second graders and 35% of our fourth grade students met the MAP RIT growth in math. And then according to the milestones data, 74% of our fourth grade students showed low growth compared to like peers and 50% of our fifth grade students showed low growth and to like peers. So we're focusing on those students this year and helping them increase that data. So we're going to continue um, to, sh to address 
the areas of need. And we're going to continue to support our teachers and support our students each and every day, just like we are for achievement. So you'll see below our this year's school improvement goals, our math and our ELA SMART goals. Um, about 75 percent of our K-5 students will meet or exceed their RIT growth according to the MAP assessment that we give three times a year. In math and also ELA, the percentage of third, fourth, and fifth grade students at the proficient and distinguished levels on the math and ELA sections will increase by 30 percent, that's a 10 percent gain each year. Also, we're not going to forget our kindergarten through second grade students. In our third ELA SMART goal, 85% of them will achieve their reading expectations at the end of the year according to our BLT Rigby reading assessment. Our attendance SMART goal is that we want to decrease our students who are absent six or more days a year by 5% reduction each year. And we are continuing, we're already utilizing our plan for this year. And our teachers know what our goals are, and we're working every day to achieve these. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They, they are being slightly modest, but uh, in terms of, as Dr. Archibald mentioned, really focusing on growth, that is a uh, major area of emphasis underneath the accountability system and they've got the growth thing going on and it's because they know every single child in that school and what that child needs and so they, they, they have a model of, of being able to focus on that so they're very student individualized level. Next up we have North Jackson. Okay. Well thank you first of all for giving North Jackson the opportunity to give you a snapshot. Um, Dr. Dean and I hopefully will give you a, a small picture of kind of all the things that we're doing at North Jackson this year and last year. One of the first things on there is um, achievement. Um, reading overall was our strength in um, fifth grade science and social studies. Um, we have some uh, jam up teachers in that grade level that really uh, strive to do those remarkable experiences and uh, the reading is attributed to having just a solid foundation of what guided reading should look like um, and as as a greatest area of need really it's the writing the ELA piece and then the math and so um, basically we need to revisit that writing piece and strengthen that along with math support um, and Dr. Dean is going to share some of the things that we're doing to support the ELA and the math. Um, what we've done is we have placed an additional support teacher um, or additional teacher at the third grade level to help out with that, as well as we've added a grades three through five paraprofessional to help address the areas of needs for students. Um, we are also utilizing Reese's ELA and math support um, specialist, as well as Dr. Katie Warwick to help improve professional learning, demonstrations, and feedback to teachers, as well as to us and how to support our teachers. Um, we've also established a vertical team for math to review grade level expectations and increase rigor to meet the needs of all students. The team reviews data to guide instruction, instructional planning, as well as practices to maximize student achievement. And then looking at our growth piece, really overall fourth grade has demonstrated uh, consistent growth over the last several years um, in ELA and math performance in levels three and four. Um, and we attribute that to basically having quarterly and grade level um, meetings at system level and also at grade at school level. Um, what is the uh, school's lowest area of growth? Really math overall is where we've identified that we really need to provide extra support in that piece um, as far as looking at um, growth and then also looking at trying to push students to that level three and four. We have most of our students are performing at level two and we're really trying to uh, achieve that levels three and four um, milestones. What we've done to address this is that we've added um, additional support personnel both to third and fifth grades. Our district math coordinator comes over monthly to meet with these teachers and uh, modeling, providing feedback, um, anything that they need to support that as well, and also giving us feedback on how to support additionally. Currently, we have two teachers that are working on their math endorsement and four teachers taking either the CGI or number sense courses through RESA. And as if you flip over on the back, you can see our uh, goals for this year is basically focusing on math, um, trying to put more of our students in that levels of three and four, 
and then also having that basically 15% growth over the next five years, but that's a 3% growth each year. Um, and then also looking at, at our MAP scores, just trying to, to our students to show the growth and meet the percentage of that growth too as well. So we're shooting for 25% over the next five years at 5% growth each year. We hope to surpass that and we've got those things in place to, to embrace that and to get us to that level. Also goal two is looking at our ELA uh, reading assessment pieces and that's on GMAS. You'll see 15% growth over the next five years with 3% each year and then looking at um, math assessment doing 25% and that's doing the 5% growth each year. And then also attendance. Um, we have pretty, our attendance is pretty good right now so when you get on the higher end it's harder to show the, the improvement in that area but we're looking to do 5% improvement over the next five years and that's with 1% each, each school year. So that is kind of where we are. As a snapshot of North Jackson we're doing lots of uh, things this year to step things up and one of them is adding STEM in as a special instead of doing our computer lab and students are already telling us that they love that as one of their specials and so we're trying to up the rigor as well as provide additional experiences for kids that they will leave, leave a lasting impression as well as ramp up their science and math piece there. So as West Jackson Elementary makes their way, one of the things that hopefully you're hearing is a commonality amongst uh, the fact that we, we want to take the opportunity to public to thank the board for the investment in our instructional coach, Katie Ward, the fact that we have a literacy coach position posted out there. You've heard, you're hearing a theme of professional learning. You've heard Matt. These are all things that you've supported us in. in if my former colleague was here, he would talk about the years of well, and we can distance ourselves from those years of well. And so we're, we're finally getting into a point where we have district alignment. We still have areas for improvement, but when I listen to it, it gives me a great sense of pride that, that, that we're utilizing all the resources and that we're, we're seeing the improvement that uh, we know is capable of, or we're capable of as uh, individuals, schools, and as a system. So there is a very robust team up here at West Jackson. Yes, we have our whole team up here, and I did want to take a moment to introduce Lori King in case you have not met her. She's our new instructional coach. I think you know the other members of our team here, Mr. Knuff and Dr. Roanroth, and so I appreciate them being up here, and I also called Mr. Johnson today, and I told him to feel free to um, pipe in at any time because we're really <laughs> celebrating a lot of his data, so I hope that he will um, share anything that he may want to during this time too. But I also want to say that he has really laid the groundwork for great work at West Jackson Elementary, so I feel very blessed to be joining this team in our school because it is certainly a culture that looks at data, it's a culture of student goal setting, and a culture that is very willing to dig into the work that's um, there to be done. So we have some celebrations to share, and we also have some areas where we are certainly um, working really hard to, to make improvement. So I'm gonna let Dr. Rodenroth share a little bit about some of our areas of achievement. So one of our greatest areas is the steady increase of students who have um, performed at level two, three, or four on the math milestones. And on your sheet, you could, if you follow the cohort of students, you can see the growth over the last three years. And also those scoring at level three and four, which is the expected level of performance, um, not where we want to be, but definitely seeing that steady increase over the past three years. Another area of achievement is the grade level status. So we're above the district and the state in grades three, four, and five, and above RESA in grades four and five. Still not where we want to be in reading, but great gains, reason to celebrate. Um, kindergarten reading and math GKIDS data is above the um, highest in the district in terms of meeting and exceeding those elements. And what we attribute to the success is focusing on the student goal setting, focusing on rigor, looking at data during our grade level PLC time and protecting that time for our teachers, increasing the time for math instruction from 50 minutes to 90 minutes, um, consistent practice for guided math and CGI, implementing a vertical math PLC where we focused on a um, need of fluency and also implemented a BMT which kind of mimics the BLT where we're tracking um, math skills and making sure that kids are demonstrating mastery before they enter in the next grade on those specific skills. And one other piece that we had that was a great celebration for achievement is the five-star climate rating. And I think we were one of the only elementary schools to have that climate rating. So just looking at attendance behavior and those, that survey data too. So that was good. All right, so looking at our greatest area of need. 
Um, we really, you know, and I'll echo some of the things that the other schools said, but even though we're pleased in a way that we're getting a lot of kids to grade level in terms of reading, it's not playing out in our ELA scores. So really thinking about those text-based writing pieces and getting kids to that point where they can select the best evidence and really to, um, whether it's informational or argumentative writing or, or the narrative, we really don't have strengths in any of those areas. So we are working hard in that area. If you want to take a, a look at the data, we have some success and some growth in, in our cohorts, but our, I would say our significant focus and area of need is looking at our third grade. Um, we only had 33% get to that level three and four, and um, fourth grade 51% and fifth grade 39%. So those just are not acceptable to us, and those are the areas that we are pushing hard across the district and at our school to really tighten up practices and build stamina and um, to really build out that clear expectation for what the literacy block should look like so that we're getting kids to that. And I'm gonna let Lori share a little bit too because one of our big areas of focus has been protecting time for our PLCs and making sure that those PLCs are very uh, focused on instruction and not you know, minutia that can sometimes interfere and making sure that we're really getting the work done to make those improvements. And so we're spending a lot of time in our PLCs. We're focusing one day heavily on literacy and another day heavily on math. And we're really working with our uh, teachers and kind of talking that common language and really looking at looking at how we teach, what is our framework and our model for literacy and our framework and model for, for math, and what does that look like? How are we effectively implementing gradual release? How are we effectively implementing um, floor blocks? And what does that look like in the classroom? And then through our common collaborative planning, we're also then looking at how does that come out with the need for common resources and having that common um, student work to look at and use that data piece to move and drive our instruction, our exemplars, and then really using the work in the language of the standard, looking at the ALDS, because that's kind of where we want to be headed on that continuum for level threes and fours, and constantly looking at that and our student work is our student work and discussion reflecting the rigor of the standard as well. Um, we're hitting that in our um, plannings and even down in kindergarten, looking at that student work and that rigor as well. And then um, doing a uh, vertical um, ELA walk. Again, we're looking at writing samples and student work and are we building each year and increasing that rigor? Um, kind of what's that journey and path our students are taking? We're really working hard to build that literacy culture. Um, what book are you reading right now? And we've got posters up around our school and highlighting um, just interesting um, books, trying to get kids just excited and pumped about reading and modeling that excitement and enthusiasm ourselves. So we're really building that stamina and that love um, for literature. Um, ensuring best practices, um, we're working with um, not only Peggy Terrell, but um, modeling lessons myself, and then highlighting our awesome teachers that we have, and the great work that they're doing in the classroom, and highlighting their best practices um, amongst grade levels, and there's a, you can learn a lot from kindergarten all the way up through fifth grade teachers. Good teaching is good teaching. Um, continuing the work of the GCA assessments, and then um, also looking at MAPS data and really highlighting our teachers. We had a teacher today present to the staff on how to effectively use that MAP data and how you can determine and really use that to help guide your instruction and guided reading. So that's so where we're headed. All right, thank you. And so then moving on to growth, we do have some celebrations with growth uh, for sure. And uh, just as a reminder, we're looking for that high growth, which is that 65% and above. So that's where we um, kind of get that celebration is when we get to that point. And so some of that data is embargoed, but we did have some of the highest growth in fifth grade math. So that was a huge celebration to see that growth. And that's what we want across um, all of our areas is to get to that 65, 75 um, growth percentile and looking at that. So John's gonna share a little bit about our growth data. Um, Dr. Hardegree hit on part of it. Our fifth grade math milestones, they had a median growth percentile of of uh, 75.5 percent, so that's definitely high growth. Uh, our ELL students had an 80 percent uh, growth percentile, which was fantastic. If you know Lynn Romo, you can understand. She is wonderful. Um, Hispanic students went from a growth percentile of 40 percent in 2016 to 52 percent in 2017. Um, we also had first and first and fifth grade uh, math map data. Uh, were our highest growth uh, on the MAP assessment. And then um, kindergarten with reading and math, they showed high growth there. And also in the ELA and math, G-Kids data were the highest in the system. So our 
our teachers were uh, working very hard and we were extremely proud of that. Uh, things we can attribute this to for math, uh, CGI, we worked really hard with, with Marty um, on that. Number talks, guided math, working to a 90 minute instructional block for math. Um, and one of the things I guess we could point to on both uh, a growth in those areas where we've gone to common planning time um, for all of our teachers, grade level planning time. For reading and language arts, uh, just best practices from four blocks, really working with mentor sentences, and Diane Mergel's one of the people that's really worked hard on that. Um, uh, teaching student strategies on how they can tackle unknown words, uh, sight words push, um, and um, I would even say working really hard on getting aligned with Lexile and Lexile levels has helped with that too. All right. And then looking at our school's lowest area of growth, um, as compared to math, ELA is significantly lower when we look at our median growth percentile. So that is certainly an area that we are really focused on. We um, are only in the low to typical growth and specifically our gifted population. So we've talked a lot about enrichment versus acceleration and how can we really, we know our kids are getting great engaging experiences, but how can we really make sure that that's paying off in the skills that they're developing that will serve them, especially as they head into middle school. So as, and we've been a part of the um, Northeast Georgia research, uh, cohort to really dig into the Z-score data. So when we did that, we noticed that we're doing really a good job of getting our kids out of the level one, but our mid and highest quartiles, we're just not moving those kids. And so that is an area and we've um, really talked as a team about what we can do to address that. And we're excited because we think a lot of the things that we're planning will address that need. Um, but like I said, just really making sure that those kids that we know are most capable are really being pushed to grow. So some of the things that we're working on to do that, um, as Ms. King mentioned, really establishing a clear framework for math and a clear framework for literacy, and also really thinking through that lens of efficiency with our instructional time and also through the lens of rigor and alignment. So are the things that we're doing with kids really um, aligned to those standards in a way that it's going to pay off for them as, as they move forward? We've been doing a lot of work um, with all of the folks who can support us, but we've also been doing a lot of talking within our building and planning for how we can incorporate some things like project-based learning and our STEAM initiatives to really engage our kids and not just with cool projects, we want to inspire them, but with projects that are really um, very closely aligned and deeply rigorous um, so that we get kids moving along um, the way that we need to. So we're excited about that work. We also have done some work with um, Ms. Tanell pushing into some of the content areas to support and um, just continuing to think about how we can raise that level of rigor and um, support students at higher levels of thinking, really being very strategic about our planning. And that's, I think, been a lot of the work in the PLCs to think about, okay, so is this really aligned to that um, achievement level descriptor and, and are we planning those strategic questions to get kids thinking at a deeper level? So, so we are excited for, uh, about all of those pieces. While I've got you here, I just wanted to take a moment to share also some of our other goals. So I'll, I'll read quickly through our goals. Of course, we do have a math and an ELA goal um, and we're looking really at uh, focusing on levels three and four and pushing, uh, continuing to push 3% each year on that. Um, we do have an attendance goal and we've got some things going. We're trying to do monthly rewards for attendance, make phone calls. Um, Mr. Knapp's really good about kind of thinking through that lens of how can we build those parent relationships to make sure that we're getting kids to school. And so we're trying to do that. We're doing a lot of um, celebrations, both with attendance and then also in our academic areas as well. Um, parent engagement and partnerships is one of the areas and that falls right in line with the work that we're wanting to do with establishing a culture for STEAM and project-based learning. So we've established some really exciting partnerships with Amazon and Kubota. Um, we actually have a partnership with the High Museum of Art. So they're working with us to collaborate on some, you know, how can we use this piece of art to really infuse the math and science? How can we take a, a piece of art and springboard from that with a project-based learning experience? And we actually have um, Northeast Georgia Risa and the Georgia Youth Science Technology Center coming on Monday to model a PBL with all of our teachers. So they'll cycle through. So it'll be kind of a professional learning experience for them, but the kids will be involved in it as well. And then following up with a whole school training for PBL. So we're um, excited about that. And um, so our last goal is really just to move along that continuum. So thinking through our instructional goals, they fit very closely with our goals for STEAM and PBL. 
And I mentioned this um, visual to Dr. Howard, so I'll just share it with you, but we're kind of thinking about the, the visual of a railroad track, and many of you know I lived on the railroad tracks for quite a long time, so that just popped into my head this summer, but it fits with our theme of being full steam ahead, and one of those railroad tracks is really quality best practices and that consistency of practice and the other is innovation so we're just hoping to keep those two moving along because we know if you get one out of whack it's not good but when they go together that's really where we want to be so great great yeah. so thank you for your time thank any you questions for us <laughs> So it's hard to cram everything in a couple of minutes. Our schools are doing some wonderful work that you have a little bit more detail from each of our schools and your courses are following on. Dr. Howard, I'm assuming you might want to introduce the, um, the next topic. Yes, I do. And I thank you. Before I, before I speak to that briefly, and I did share this briefly with the board last week, um, I want to say a very special thank you to our school leaders who are here. And um, it is very evident when you watch them collaborate as a group of um, elementary principals and when our middle and high school are together, they are passionate about the work. We are not where we want to be yet. And I hope, you know, we are never fully arrived because you don't you don't continue to improve if once you feel like you've arrived. So thank you for pouring into our kids and to our families and some really good stuff happening. I'm, I'm excited about all the work that's going on. So thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Nicholson referenced the fact that we all recognize that we've kind of been on a journey for the past few years, but we're to a place now, thanks to a lot of hard work on many people's behalf, that financially we're in a much better position. And so it's time that we really invest in our teachers and in our leaders and give them the support and sustainability that they, they deserve. And so an opportunity has arisen for us to participate um, with two other districts in the Northeast Georgia region and the Page Foundation. Page Foundation has offered to sponsor this. So I just wanted you to be aware that we spoke with the principal leadership teams about it today and um, they are on board, they're, they're excited and most all of our schools will participate this, in this. It'll be a two day training and it's really based around, uh, Dr. Hardigree referenced the consistency of practice as well as the innovation and the Schlechty Center focuses on continuous improvement through innovation. Uh, so it's, I think it's gonna be a great opportunity. I just wanted you to be aware that we will be embarking on that. Uh, and there is a component that invo involves the board. So if you wanna mark your calendars for November 29th and uh, that's the day before we go to, to um, GSBA, but we'll have uh, principals and each principal who's participating chooses four teachers to participate with them. Um, it'll be a full two days at the Jefferson Civic Center and we'll be just digging into the work of establishing sustainable improvement. So moving completely away from the whack-a-mole approach and being very consistent in the way that we implement uh, improvement through innovation. So I think this is gonna be a great opportunity. You hopefully have had a chance to research a little bit in the handout that I gave you on Friday. The Schlechty Center is one of the most respected institutes for professional learning and growth in probably in the world, but certainly in the United States. So I'm excited about that opportunity. And thank uh, Northeast Georgia Risa and the Page Foundation for sponsoring that because it's it's quite an um, expensive task, but we're gonna we're gonna have it granted to us. So thank you, Mr. Nicholson. In that vein, we've got some achievement updates that we want to celebrate. One of both of them are great. So They're I'll let you fantastic. take that, Lori. They're fantastic, absolutely. So the first one that we would definitely like to highlight is the graduation rate. So I'll, I'll paint the context for you. 2016, the state average was 79. 79.2 percent the state average is 80.6 but jackson county is not going to be state average i mean that come on low bar right so uh, 50 states i mean 50 counties in the state had a 90 uh, uh, average of 90 percent or above and we certainly were one of those we were number 18th out of 188 reported and um, particularly pleased with that but if you listen to the specifics at East Jackson County Comprehensive High School, they had a rate of 95.56, which is really impressive. So round of applause out there for, for East Jackson yeah. County Comprehensive High School. Yeah. Uh, and they were the highest in Jackson County, the other school system in our county, I've heard, and they were the highest. And that, that they ranked at 47th in the state, so that is pretty uh, pretty impressive. Jackson County Comprehensive High School was went from 85.77 to 94.4, and they were 63 out of all of the, I think it was 400 and something schools, 443 schools listed. So again, a round of applause for Jackson County. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
so those are numbers, but it takes a lot of work. It, it, it starts with the teachers creating experiences that, that make kids want to come to school. It starts in our elementary schools, building that, that sense of, of responsibility and, and having the students really just be a part of something bigger than themselves and something they can take pride in. So it really does start with pre-K, and this is the 21st, 25th. 25th birthday of pre-K this year and it starts there and it carries all the way through because graduation is the is the the goal that we have for all of our students so very impressive statistics and we might just recognize those folks again Monday night since we, they'll be there we, 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 <laughs> yeah. um, I would like to turn to Mr. Johnson who is going to share some equally as impressive data on the ACT well in, in all that work that's been going on uh, to increase that graduation rate definitely shows that post-secondary uh, readiness with the ACT. Um, and just a couple of pieces of data here to share with you. Um, for the first time, uh, it, at least uh, in a very long time, both high schools both scored not only above the state, but above the nation in terms of their ACT overall performance. So um, in both high schools, um, uh, Couple of things to point out um, for East Jackson Comprehensive High School um, over the last four years, I've seen a continual increase uh, with their current score being a 21.5, and that's up from a 20.2 last year. So we're talking about it being a complete point increase for them uh, and then some. And then Jackson County High School posted their high score uh, in the last five years, um, and they were up with a 21.6. Um, so both schools. Uh, doing a great job there. Um, another thing to point out is that we've had a 173% increase in the number of students participating in the ACT. Um, and that's a big thing because a lot of times when you've got those, those numbers, you know a couple of kids can make uh, a small difference, large difference according to what you're working with. But back in 2013, I pulled a little bit of data, we had 56 kids taking the ACT compared to now with 153 uh, students. And then talking with the principals about uh, what's that reason for success and, and what they're doing is using that PSAT data that they're getting from uh, our students early in their uh, career when they're taking it in the 10th grade and utilizing that to um, sit down with students and talk to them about the career path of study and then also encouraging them as far as ACT and SAT preparation. So uh, very excited about what they've got going on right now and, and it is showing. So. Mr. Johnson, can you make sure you get those numbers to Mr. Buckman? Because I know he had to leave. I know he had to leave. It's, not a, it's not a bragging thing or anything, but you know, we've got a lot of people that, that are in, in, the, in the community that, that feel that we are not uh, superior as, as other districts around. So this just goes to show that, that that's wrong. That information needs to get out. That, that certainly our high schools, all the way from elementary, all the way to the high school, are doing something really good and, and improves by numbers. Yes, sir, and, and I'll have to brag on Miss Bridgman because uh, she and I have already been working together, and uh, she's got some data for me to uh, submit to the papers. Good, so we'll very good. Very good. Might be an appropriate time for Karen to to share a little bit about how we share our media and why the graduation rate was embargoed until last Wednesday, um, and. You want to speak to when we deal with hard numbers on things like this we usually give the newspapers the first opportunity to do those hard news stories particularly in our county where we have three school systems um, we obviously are being compared to them and, and we can't submit the story that compares those sure. numbers we were a little disappointed uh, in the stories this week there are a couple of stories in the paper they are very small and, mm -hmm. and not particularly rich in detail we're going to publish our information uh, on our website uh, and on our social media pages so that our community is aware of it and certainly those are open to anybody then who would like to find that data and, and know a little bit more about what we're doing. I'd certainly like to see that being the headline rather than the Waffle House being smothered by the Braselton Council, which was in today's Braselton paper, mm -hmm. as a headline for the paper. I'm sorry, that just doesn't cut it for me. So uh, I appreciate you working with them. Thank you. We are certainly proud of them, and we, sell, yeah. we celebrate them every chance we get. Yes, we are. We made some balloon bouquets and lots of bazaars. That's right, we did mm -hmm. last week. All right. All right. Moving right along, uh, the next item is teacher devices, and the board, you approved a while back the purchase of some teacher devices, and that's that's uh, something that uh, took a slightly longer than we had hoped. We had to kind of renegotiate partnerships with uh, 
vendors, and you would think that people would just want to take your money. They want to take your money, but they don't always want to give you what you want in exchange for your money. No. So <laughs> I know this is a new concept. Uh, but but underneath uh, Mike Summers' leadership, we were able to uh, not only bridge new relationships, but better relationships. We're going to get a much better product yeah. from than we would have in the previous. Uh, and so. They are to arrive Monday, if I'm not mistaken. We have, at this point, 300 devices. And if you'll recall, um, we're, we're doing it in waves. So we're purchasing for this year, middle school and high school. And Mr. Summer and his team already have a plan. Once they come in, they have to do some background stuff, imaging them. Um, but because of the work they've been doing in the background with, with the, uh, kind of the, the infrastructure and, and creating what I would refer to as a, a nicely paved Autobahn, uh, these machines will come on and they'll be like Ferraris on the Audubon. And so he's going, he and his team will go out to the schools and during planning periods issue these new devices to the middle school and high school. What we would like to do at that point then is take the best of what we have, because we still do have some machines that are, that are reasonable. I mean, they're not great, but they're reasonable. And what he and his team will do is they have a rubric of sorts they'll go through, they'll identify which ones just need to be in a parts pile, which ones can actually go out to schools and then issue those to our elementary schools, issue those to anybody who has a machine that, that literally always needs to be plugged in. Let's, let's get our elementary teachers something slightly better for this year with the idea that, that uh, next year with your blessing, we will do the same thing with elementary school purchase around the devices for them. Did I leave anything out, Mr. Summer? Anything you'd like to add? Well, and that will begin a cycle of replacement, yes, and that's in our plan. And so we brought to you a splice uh, request earlier in the mm -hmm. summer to purchase. We'll begin bringing another splice request to you on Monday evening for approximately $200,000 now to start the deployment of our uh, student devices. So um, we shifted that from our general fund when we just made some decisions about our teacher compensation and so forth. So you can look for that on Monday evening. And, and, it, and I'm glad you mentioned that, Dr. Howard, because it, what this allows us to do is instead of having to replace everything when, when if we buy everything at one time, it becomes very cost prohibitive to do so. So we, we're very grateful to our elementary teachers who are, are going to um, be very patient with having a device for one more year, but then they get a nice new fresh device. And, and these are um, more robust than what we've had in the past, and they, they have their two-in-one feature, so you can use it as a tablet and you can project directly from the projector in the places where we have these interactive projectors so you don't have to be um, connected to the wall so that you can actually walk around when you're teaching and, and so I'm pretty excited about the opportunities that that will bring. Dr. Howard actually mentioned the next one that is that we just rolled out on Monday the competitive grant process for our one-to-one -one, and those are the Chromebooks and we did purchase a hundred of those earlier this year but we, we uh, in our plan last year, we were hoping that we would be able to do a thousand a year for the four years because that would get it. And last year was year one. That would allow us to get to a one to one ratio in third through twelfth grade. But instead of just putting them into classrooms, doing a competitive grant process that uh, I believe Miss Flippin shared a few months ago, it allows us to give them to the folks who are just super eager to use them. And then you have models for how they can be used. We will still, with your blessing, get to that one to one. It's just what we found sometimes just putting a device in somebody's classroom, if they're not completely ready to use it or they don't have a professional learning or don't know what to do with it, then, then let's let's give them some models that they can go see and provide that professional learning and so then they can do another round or we'll continue to do these rounds of grants as we're allowed to do so and then be able to put those machines into teachers' mm -hmm. hands so they can use them with their students and ultimately our vision hopefully is that uh, maybe at some point as you graduate, not literally when you walk across the stage, but when you leave the school, we can say, here's a machine that's it's four years old at this point, and it's gonna do better in your hands than it would do in our hands, potentially, and move forth and, and use this device. As, 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 as yeah. Kids, yeah. Um, yeah, that would be an aspiration that we have. Mm -hmm. Questions, comments, thoughts, concerns, about? All right. Well, then I'm going to ask Martha, if you don't mind, to talk a little bit about the Swiss amendments. Sure. So we um, do an evaluation of our Swiss um, contract to see if we need to add any additional uh, potential waivers to that. So we're asking for the amendment to, to three different areas. One is the addition of CTAE to the educational programs waiver. The other is to the waiver for the school day and school year, which will give us flexibility on a lot of different things as far as when we start down the road of personalized learning, how much 
you know, time we spend on particular tasks and such, we will have flexibility to, to work around those particular rules. And then the third one is public school choice, um, where we have to use size only currently to determine whether or not students can be um, can choose to go to a different school within the district. And that caused us a little bit of issue to this year with our zoning and um, with out-of-district out of students. Um, if, if they closed down school choice, we had to close down out-of-district. So we're asking for um, a waiver on that one so that we have a little bit more flexibility to add some additional criteria to that. And um, that, that should help our schools on that. So with how, for example, for House Bill 251, um, student may choose to go to, to whatever school they want, and we, we certainly usually honor that based on space or available programs. But this would give us the ability to say, you know, if you've chosen to go to that school, you understand that you provide transportation, but that doesn't mean you can be an hour late every day. And so if that's not meeting your child's needs, we need to make sure that those children are getting what they need and that they're able. So it, it gives us the same ability to hold parents and students to the same standard that we do everyone else. So um, that's, I appreciate you um, reviewing this. Martha and I sat down and went over these and this will again, um, we are, we appreciate the fact that we recognize the need for consistency of practice and being very solid in our expectations um, that these additional waivers will give us some flexibility that may or may not be needed, but likely um, will help us. So that would be an action item on Monday evening with your, with your, support we'd like to request these and then the next step would be to send these on to the state board of education for us to have this amended on our official contract with the doe so um, if you have any questions about that i'll be in the office tomorrow please feel free to call me i'll be happy to talk through it or meet with you um, and as um, martha mentioned you made reference to educational programs with ctae i just want to make you aware that the technical scholar Technical Colleges and Schools of Georgia group will be visiting us on Tuesday uh, at 9.30. They have a team coming. They have reviewed our college and career application. I think this is a good indicator, no way of us knowing, that they want to come and talk with us. So we have our steering committee representatives that will meet here in this room, and they'll meet with about six individuals from the grant reviewers and the Technical Colleges and Schools of Georgia team. So that's Tuesday. Uh, we still will not know until later in November whether or not we're in consideration, but we'll, we'll know everything official about a Power College and Career Academy by the first week of December. So that's encouraging news. Mm -hmm. Just make you aware they'll be here. Notice they're having several commercials on TV now uh, regarding that. They said there's 22 locations in mm -hmm. the state for the technical college. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're still very hopeful. Uh, lots of community members. Again, every opportunity you have to thank. It would be hard to list the folks, but we had some really powerful um, conversation and support from our community involving this grant, and so we're we are very, very appreciative for their work. We're very appreciative. So. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Teaching and Learning, and again, thank you to all of our schools that presented. Dr. Blankenship. Well, I'm excited to bring to you a fairly short personnel list this morning. <laughs> One highlight that I would make is that we have received uh, Ms. Papone's uh, letter uh, as an intent to retire at the end of the year. We are all heartbroken um, that, that this will be occurring, that uh, she has been a wonderful educator of, of, of our children and, and leader at East Jackson Elementary. And so uh, we will certainly be celebrating uh, her towards the end of the year along with our other retirees. That, so we have received that. Um, I, I will also alert you that pending a uh, background check, uh, we may have a couple of additions to this list. Um, we have a, uh, a paraprofessional and a bus driver that uh, we hope to be, to be uh, able to recommend and, and add to this list on, on that day. Um, Which are just replacements. The, they're just replacements, yes. And then the other updates that I have are, are really just for your information. Um, I don't talk a lot about what is going on in, in terms of uh, development, but now that the hiring season has slowed down a little bit, I'd like to share a little bit with you about what we're doing uh, to plan for development of our teachers um, as well as our leaders. And we have uh, met yesterday, we have a just a, a rock star team of teacher leaders um, and also along with Ms. Papone, she's on that uh, committee as well, to look at system-wide teacher induction 
Uh, the, the state requires us to have a system-wide plan for induction of new teachers. Um, so that those are teachers within their first three years of their teaching career. And we do have things that are happening at our school levels. We don't necessarily have consistency across our schools. So we have different activities happening at different schools in terms of induction uh, processes. And so this committee has come together. We met yesterday and had a, a very productive meeting. And we are looking at some short-term things and some long-term things. And so one of the um, one of the processes that we're looking at is to develop a comprehensive system-wide induction plan that would bring some consistency, although not standardizing, um, across our school level induction activities, as well as providing some induction level processes at the system level. And so we're gonna be working on that throughout this year, um, while in the short term, we're gonna be planning three system level um, events for our new teachers this uh, this school year. And so uh, we'll be personalizing that to, uh, to meet their needs um, based on what they feel like they most need at that time. So there'll be one meeting this semester and then hopefully two next semester. And then we'll look forward to, to uh, getting into a, a full uh, system-wide induction process for our new teachers next year. Uh, at, the, at the leadership level, we are currently looking at ways that we can provide opportunities for our aspiring leaders as well as our current leaders. We, we need to feed those leaders as well as, as our teachers. And so we've started a lunch and learn series for our current principals and assistant principals based on their identified self-identified needs. And we had our first session with that today um, with our, our principals and we'll be offering that again with our assistant principals after their, um, their monthly meeting um, very, very soon. Um, and then just to give you an update on the Frontline Insights platform, a, a couple of months ago, you all very graciously um, were supportive of us moving forward with a digital employee records management system for Frontline, which is the, uh, the company that we use for our uh, recruiting and hiring system, as well as our absence and time management. And so we are beginning the first phase of that uh, implementation that will uh, launch next Wednesday. And that is just an integration, uh, an identity integration for all of the platforms, for all of our, our staff. And so they'll, uh, it's a pretty seamless, easy process that they'll just be creating a new ID, a user ID for that platform, but it will give them the opportunity to be able to log in one time and then be able to access all three uh, platforms or any platforms that they have um, access to already. So for our principals and our bookkeepers, um, that's going to be a, a tremendous help. And then for those staff that have uh, access to a couple of different platforms, that'll, that'll make things a little bit easier for them as well. So. And then finally, I don't want to forget that we uh, have selected our system level teacher of the year, and uh, that is Ms. Debbie Darling from Gum Springs. And so we will be um, honoring all of our uh, school level teachers of the year in January. Very good. Referencing leadership, just a plug as well. I, you all probably recognize this, but um, we are blessed with some great leaders, but we don't have the succession plan and the depth that we once had in terms of future leaders. And so Dr. Blankenship is working to develop that program internally, but Northeast Georgia RESA has revamped their program, and we are, we, we are excited about that. So we have two leaders we're sending to uh, the lead program there, which is are going to be a great, great opportunity. And then just as a, a recognition of the fact that it's a concern, the state is looking at a statewide leadership academy that's going to be held by, uh, led by uh, Alvin Wilbanks in Gwinnett County and Will Schofield in, in uh, Paul County and really looking at some depth of planning statewide because we know there's going to be a significant need in your
leaders to come for strong leaders and an investment of leaders. So I think that's going to, the more tiers and uh, levels that we have for developing leaders, and we encourage principals today, if you've got some future teacher leaders, start bringing them to principals meetings, bringing them to API meetings, expose them, give them opportunities. So when we do, we've got some great teachers who could make great future leaders. And you do have a copy of an invitation to uh, Mr. Patrick's retirement reception in a couple of weeks. Oh. Um, Hope you will make time to celebrate. We are sad that he, he got a, a round of applause, and certainly our principals appreciate him, but certainly our district office does. So we'll look forward to lifting him up and celebrating him, and so grateful for the work. He's going to be a missed professional among us, that is for sure. All right. Thank you, Dr. Blankenship. Outstanding. Uh, we continue to have some positive news on the financial front. And I'll send a shout out to Erin and Anna who continue to work hard. And the timeliness of the work they're doing is amazing. Quarterly reports and the monthly reports. And so we here we are five days into the month and we already have all of our monthly reports. So share with us the most exciting report, which is on top. Lost. Um, yes, absolutely. And we continue on the... Um, path of having increased cost revenues and much higher than, than what we have anticipated or projected on our cash flow for our five years floss plan. So that it, it's just amazing to see and it, it helps us with all the things that we are planning to do and, and will need to do. And so it's, it's just constant good news. It's above, it's an increase above all um, comparisons except for um, compared to last month, but it's year over year, it's year over year, it's a, a significant increase, and even over the average, which is continuing continuing to increase also because of our higher revenues, um, it's it's just a good story. Yeah, it is. Um, the the Petite this weekend, all the restaurants are packed on fifty three tonight. So good. It's uh, Tom a good thing. <laughs> 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 a good and thing. shop. Yes. And yes. Shop. yes. Absolutely. Stay Absolutely. shop and play. That's yeah. right. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. And then I do want to point out that we're already in October and we are still doing great on our operating cash flow and there's no no expectations of needing a tan. We should start seeing some of our property tax revenue. Um, some some starts um, trickling in during November, but then we see a big big portion of it come in during December and and we're we're doing fine. So that that to me is super exciting because by this time um, of the year, we're usually we've already approved a tan mm -hmm. and usually close to doing our first draw or two mm -hmm. on it. So we are nowhere near that, and things are are looking looking great still. Right on right. track, right on line, right um, right on track for our expenditures at the um, portion of the year that we're we're at. We have. Of course, completed twenty five percent of our year, and our overall expenditures are right at twenty five percent. So that's great. Great. Mm -hmm. Something to celebrate too. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. Thank you for saying that. And we, we say this regularly because it's very special. Thank you to our principals and our teachers who have recognized the sacrifices. But it's also mm -hmm. exciting because this year, even on this track with this kind of good news, we were able to reinstate some of the resources that we've not had. So yes, um, it's 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 a good story. So it, thank you. Very exactly. Much. And again, again, like I like to like to point out, it puts us one step ahead mm -hmm. when those tax revenues start coming in. We do mm -hmm. not have to worry about paying off a multi million dollar. Alone, so yeah. get to do some other great things with it. Thank y'all again for that. Great right, job. All right, facilities updates. Um, there's just two quick items I wanted to add, and of course, we want to give Dennis and Josh an opportunity to share anything that may not be here. Uh, just wanted to make you aware that in the next month you will be seeing an advertisement for our CM at risk, and that will be for the renovation at West Jackson Middle School that's planned for this summer, uh, as well as the new construction that will likely begin um, on the Highway 332 Skelton Road property um, in, the, in the upcoming months. So as you know, we put that out for request for proposals, and we'll be sending that, that out. So you'll see that advertised. Um, and then some of you have asked, and we even have community members who have asked, and I just want to make them aware that 
the Highway 332 property activity, we will have cross, we cross country meets. So that somebody asked why there are porta potties over there. <laughs> they're not hunting. I promise they're not hunting. Uh, it's, uh, that we know of anyway. Uh, but they they have, and I'm glad they have developed that enough to use that as a cross country course. And it's so worked we, out very well. It really has beautiful property. Mm -hmm. It's probably a hilly run. I don't know, but um, it's <laughs> it, that, that's what you see happening over there. And any other updates from Josh or Dennis? Come on, Dennis. This is your last official board meeting. Yeah. You've got to have something to say. Yeah. Well, I just want to say to, to everyone, um, as I said to the principals today, I appreciate you letting me be part of this great team for about 11 years now. I've enjoyed it, and, uh, and um, I'll be back to visit. So, uh, a, lot of, a lot of exciting things coming down the road as far as facilities, and, and um, uh, so uh, I'll be, be around to visit and just see how things are going. So, but again, thank you. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dennis is a very low profile professional. He is one of those people. My dad had a sign in his office that said, nobody knows what I do until I don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've met many times, but uh, there are many behind, this, behind the scenes things that Dennis takes care of. And we are extremely grateful for all that he's invested in. Um, We'll have, we'll, we'll have big shoes to fill, that's for sure. So Josh, he and Josh have spent a lot of time together, and Josh is working hard um, at taking those on. Dennis has taken on several of his duties and responsibilities, and we're going to move forward. And that will get, did I David, just say David, that? David, 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 David has taken on his responsibilities. Just the D, that's right. Big David, little baby Dennis. <laughs> David's taken on some of Dennis's responsibilities. But anyway, we are grateful. Yeah, so that is all the updates and information we have for you. I don't believe you have a, we want to go to the executive session, have some things we want to share with us. So officially we need a vote on that. So do I have a motion that we move to executive session? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. All right. So we move to executive session. Thank you for coming here.